Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'm one of your co-hosts, Matt Bingle, and with me is my other co-host, Chris Bixby, and our host, Jake Deffenbaugh. How are you doing? Yes, we're doing great. Hey, Matt. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. Awesome. Good. Good. And who do we have today? We're very excited about this. Most of you will know him from the Disney Channel series, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, although some of you may know him from other works, such as pop it up and a bunch of other stuff that we'll get into here he is patrick bristow patrick welcome how you doing good thank you glad to be here guys awesome, awesome. happy to have you happy to have you now I'm we know sure. who you are we know okay. who you are but for those who don't would you care to introduce yourself um okay yeah uh i think what you said at the beginning covers a little bit of it most people have of a certain generation watch Zack and Cody, so they might remember the character whose name was the same as mine, Patrick, uh, the Mater D at the cafe. Uh, my hair was bright red then; it is not so today. Um, and then for maybe older audience members, they might remember me from Seinfeld as the Wig Master or um, Ellen. Um, I played her friend Peter uh, for I recurred on that for several seasons. And then you know I've shown up in this and that and the other Showgirls, Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar, you know little bits and bobs here and there nice <laughs> awesome what was your background like and how you grew up um well uh i grew up in southern california uh la Cunada first which is outside of la and then burbank um where i you know uh graduated from high school out of burbank and everything so that's where i really grew up um and uh my dad worked for jpl which is a brand was a branch of nasa the unmanned space um, program for NASA. And uh, my mom uh, was a ballet teacher. Um, and uh, my parents had met in the theater, so they'd been actors. So I grew up with their scrapbooks and looking through pictures of them and plays and everything. And I, you know, so I did plays at school and the like. And then by senior year of high school, I um, decided that I wanted to major in theater in college. So that was the kind of the turning point. Nice. Awesome. Nice. Now, Here's an interesting question. So before becoming an actor, did you have like any favorite TV shows or movies to watch growing up? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I When I was a, a kid, of course, you know, it was, there was a slight golden age of uh, television going on. So you had things like All in the Family, uh, the, the Jeffersons, um, uh, Carol Burnett show, Mary Tyler Moore show. Um, oh, oh, God, I can't remember his name. Bob Newhart. Um, oh, yes. so MASH. I mean, there were just all these great shows uh, and great comedies and ones that had sometimes, uh, you know, maybe heavy handed, but they had social messages, which were great. Um, Good Times was awesome. Um, and uh, and I just I, I think that that influenced me. Definitely Carol Burnett. I think that's what got me into sketch and being attracted to doing sillier, more heightened comedy. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so can you talk about how you were inspired to get into acting well um again like you know uh growing up with uh having my parents scrapbooks and everything around and, and hearing their stories of plays they were in and um you know and uh and a couple of b films that my dad was in one of which i just saw recently oh my god <laughs> uh, anyway um it was it was always like a possibility it wasn't something in my household that was like oh no one in this family has ever done that. We wouldn't know where to begin. It was a possibility. And I always knew that. Um, but I got into classical music in high school, uh, playing the clarinet, studying with um, uh, the principal of the LA Philharmonic, um, spending all my weekends at a youth orchestra. Um, and uh, so in the second semester of senior year, right before graduation, um, I auditioned for the, the school's uh, musical uh that spring and got a part in it and did it and then i was bit by the bug and uh that's when i decided to change my major <laughs> going into college from biology um because for some reason i thought maybe i'd be a doctor oh god mm -hmm. um, that would have been <laughs> that would have been like malpractice left and right it just 
I'd be in jail. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's when I changed over, and you know, um, I kind of never looked back. Nice, yeah, really nice. Very nice. You you, you kind of touched upon it earlier, but do you remember what your very first acting role was? Uh, professionally or my very, very first acting role, even as a kid, which one do you want? We, we can go professional. We can go professional. Okay. Professional would have been a uh, stage production, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, 1984. Um, I was 21 and I got cast as a, uh, a dancer. Um, then I also played Nachum the Beggar. I had like w- one or two lines in the opening scene and oh, okay. I, I played the clarinet in the, um, in the dream sequence and at the wedding. So oh, wow. my, my clarinet training and the dance training came in handy, finally. And um, and that got me my, my first uh, equity professional stage job. Nice. Nice. Awesome. So we you talked a little bit about it earlier, but um, now in the 90s, you played the, recur- the recurring character Peter in Ellen. Can you mm-hmm. kind of talk about what it was like getting to work with Ellen herself? Oh, yeah. Um, I had a great time with her. Um, originally, my part was a one-time guest star, and um, they just wrote this really fun character. He was so ridiculously positive. He was such a goody two-shoes. It was so fun to play him. And um, and she was very tickled by the character, the way I was doing him. Um, and we laughed a lot during that week. So I, I think probably she said, hey, let's bring him back, you know. And then I just started coming back, you know, any four to six times a season, um, and then when she was coming out, because my character was gay, they used my character smartly, I think, to um, be the conduit into certain subject matter with her. Like my character knew, you know, knew something was going on with her and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I think that helped um, help facilitate the arc that they built for her character the year prior to her coming out. And she was really, you know, she was really um, terrific to work with. She, for for me, you know, and I never saw any of the other things that people have talked about. So. Right. And do you, I'm curious, do you have any favorite episodes of Ellen that you were in? Um, yeah, there was one where we went to a retreat. I think the episode was called hello Dolly because it was like Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, we had to do these exercises and we were in a scene in a hot tub and, oh, wow. you know, which of course was not hot just so you know. Um, and uh, <laughs> there was just a lot of fun. I think she and I got to have a little more um, fun physical comedy with each other in that episode. You know, she was grabbing my face and stuff like that. And um, it just, uh, it, it felt a little bit Lucy and Ethel. I had uh, a little of that, little of that feeling. So it was really classic sitcom fun. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Definitely. <laughs> so now another show you starred in was uh, a short lived uh, sitcom on UPN called Head Over Heels. Can you talk yes. a little bit about that? Yeah, it was short lived. Um, you know, uh, I think we were shooting our eighth episode when they told us, hey, or, or maybe our seventh episode, they said, were canceled, but we still had to shoot one more episode because it was per the contract. So we shot the last episode knowing we were canceled. And that was just, you know, that's really hard. That's like, you know, that's like having someone like going, okay, we're going to paint this house again and then they're going to demolish it. So oh, wow. you, just don't, you just don't care as much about how, you know, I mean, you do, you have to, professional, <laughs> but um, it's harder. It's a lot harder. Yeah, that show was um the show was very silly. It was very fun. Um, I loved the cast and uh the the writers and the showrunners were a lot of people I think who had done Married with Children. Oh so yes, it, it had that kind of spicy dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um and it was very silly. It was the only show I've ever got to, got to play my own twin on, and that was that was a blast. So I, just knowing oh, that wow. I have where I've got tape of me playing my own twin, um I feel like I, like I arrived in in the world of sitcoms once you played your own twin i think you can quit <laughs> yeah so now one of the other roles that you're most known for was as you mentioned playing uh patrick in the sweet life of zach and cody what was it like yeah. working on that show oh a blast absolute blast um the uh the directors um the showrunners and the writers were all veterans um they had written you know for things like golden girls and stuff like that and so yeah. they knew their way around 
you know, that kind of script where it's a setup knockdown kind of jokey script. Mm -hmm. And then you had to write that while preserving the story and preserving the characters and some, you know, some level of integrity, even though it's a very broad, broad strokes, you know, kids show mm -hmm. it, it had mm -hmm. the, it had the discipline and underpinning of like, like a good sitcom, which I, I found uh, to be a real, really a relief. Cause I was a little nervous going like, okay, what's this going to be like, you know, is this yeah. going to be like, you know, baby show or something like that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't think I'm designed for that. And it wasn't that. And, um, and the boys, um, uh, I was about to say their character's name, uh, Cole and Dylan, um, were mm -hmm. very professional. You know, they were still kids, which was great. Um, I think their dad really instilled a, a, a good sense of, you know, professionalism in them um, without, you know, making them grow up too fast. That's what it felt like. You know, it felt like they were being handled really well and really responsibly. Um, and, you know, and, and again, it was it was fun. The only one, only episode that was not fun for me was when we did the one where the they make the commercial for the Tipton Hotel. Oh yes, I remember that number. episode. Yeah. All right. Well, you know that took days to you know choreograph and learn and do over and over and over and over. Imagine, I, I, yeah. I was not a spring chicken then. All right. <laughs> I was so achy. You would have thought I had you know gotten the National Company of Cats or something. It was you know I'd been <laughs> dancing twelve hours a day, and I wasn't doing anything that hard, but. I, but by the time we shot it, every time I had to go down on my knee for one move, there was a little part of me that went, Ugh! and it actually made the sound. <laughs> but you can't hear that because we're doing it to an audio track that was recorded, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, oh. But yeah, I'm, every time I'm going down on my knee, I'm going, <laughs> and then I don't know what noise I made when I got back up, but I'm sure it was <laughs> equally as ugly. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So who would you say were some of your favorite characters to do scenes with? Oh, uh, you mean in, in Sweet Life? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I enjoyed them all, you know. Um, I, mm. I I can't really say that there, there was a favorite, except I will say that when I was um, working with Phil Lewis, you know, because we mm. were the, two, you know, the two more mature gentlemen on the set, <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, there was a certain ease of that, you know, between takes, we might talk about subjects that were unique maybe to our generation or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, knew the same people, that kind of stuff. And then Brian's to panic, but then Brian, you know, he was playing that character out in left field, which was just mm -hmm. so like, he was, it was hard not to laugh around him. Yeah, he, he really is a funny guy. Yeah, and they all are, but Watch like one, yeah. even just like in that kind of Kramer way, just like suck you into their their universe for a second, and you lose your footing. <laughs> uh, now th this is going to be a tough question, I'm sure. But do uh, you have do you have any favorite episodes that you were in from Sweet Life? Um, to be quite honest, I don't always remember. I like remember bits and pieces of them and I'd have to go back and actually watch them or, or look at the scripts and see the outlines and go, oh right, that's what happened. Um yeah. I I think ooh, I don't think I have my fa a favorite episode. I'm sorry. I wish I did, but I don't think no, I have that's a, fine. I do have a, no um, I, a kind of a I wouldn't say it's a favorite memory, but it's one that sticks out is there was one where we were auditioning for something and I had to twirl a rope. Oh yes, I remember that one. Yeah, <laughs> they, got, they got they got me a rope, and they had somebody show me how to do it. And I was doing it in my spare time. That's all I was doing was doing the friggin' rope, and <laughs> I I couldn't. I, and I got it for like half a second, and then it went away. And I got it for half a second, and, and whatever I did in the show was. Uh... But how cool would it have been had I been able to really just get that that thing going and maybe get it up and down one time or something like that? Is I should have been able to do it. I had like, you know, three or four days to get right. that home and I couldn't. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I I really I really like the episode um where it was when it was around when Ashley Tisdale's character came back to the show because she was off filming high school musical too. Oh right. And it was the episode where a bunch of you guys <laughs> were doing this uh team building kind of exercise thing. That's one yeah. episode that I really liked. Yeah, I remember Kara Tates was in that one too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 
very funny lady. Yes. Uh, that whole show, I mean, I I love that show to death. Yeah, it was it was a good one. I think it holds up too. Uh, definitely, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Are you still in contact with anyone from the sweet life? No. <laughs> I mean, occasionally via, via Facebook, but I'm one of those people that like, I, you know, I, I enjoy people when I'm working with them. Occasionally you meet somebody that you, you keep in contact with, but I kind of um, just run back home afterwards. I'm not the most social uh, person at this, you know, phase of my life. I kind of, you know, like being comfortable and just <laughs> a quiet time. So <laughs> I, you know, people always say like, oh, are you still in touch with this person? I'm like, no. And then they start looking at me like, why not? You know, like, <laughs> why wouldn't you be at the whole? You know, if I run into them or there's any reason to to see them, it's it's all good. It's great. Yeah. That. And then there's those vows like, okay, we'll be in touch. We'll stay in touch. We'll stay in touch. And we don't stay in touch. Yeah. I mean, same, same for me. I'm <laughs> terrible at keeping in touch with people. Yeah. I mean, you have the, you have the people in your life that, you know, there's a real primary connection with. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's much more about, we worked on the same show. Mm -hmm. It's much more about, you know, deeper, um, uh, uh, on a wider uh, range of, 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 of topics and I, and, 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 and things. So, um, you know, I've, yeah, I've got a small circle of uh, friends and then I've got my students um, which over the years rotate and come and go. And I'm actually, I stay more in touch with my students than I do with people I work with. Hmm. <laughs> so now you've also appeared on um, some other shows for a family like That's So Raven, which is one of my favorite shows. And uh, Good Luck Charlie, Malcolm in the Middle, Zoe 101. What, what, what you know, what, what, what were those shows like? Um, Malcolm in the Middle was particularly fun because I got to do it twice as two different characters. Mm. Um, I did one where it was a murder mystery weekend kind of thing, uh, where we were terrible actors doing a, a costumed murder mystery. That was a blast. And then there was another one where I played, um, uh, the father of, of a kid who, who bit, he was a red haired kid. Um, and Mary Gross and I played the parents and we were leaving the kid for like the weekend with, uh, with, with the family. Um, huh. So that, that was, you know, really fun to to, to get to go back there twice. Um, Zoe 101, I only vaguely remember. It's one of the many times that I played either a theater teacher, a choir teacher, or a music teacher who was directing the school production. Huh. <laughs> I've done that storyline uh, probably too many times. Yeah. Um, and uh, what was the other one you mentioned? um good luck charlie and that's so raven uh yeah that's so raven was a lot of fun um and uh and, and she was a doll the whole cast were great um yeah and the, ep the episode you were in road to audition that's like probably one of my favorite episodes i hear that a lot and then i also hear the good luck charlie um one that a lot of people really love that one the one with the um, uh, where i was the social science teacher mm. um but uh yeah the the, the um that's so Raven was uh, definitely a lot of fun. Um, it was one of the ones where I'm wearing glasses that aren't mine. And when they put me in glasses that aren't mine and I don't have contacts on, everyone's a blur. Everything's a blur. And so I end up like not recognizing people, um, bumping into things, <laughs> stepping off platforms, not realizing there's a difference. It's really fun. So that's actually the one thing I remember about that. <laughs> <laughs> trying not to hurt myself <laughs> that week <laughs> so so now in addition to uh acting you also direct you've also directed some things too how did directing kind of first come into play um well you know i haven't directed tv you know or or, or film i've directed a few projects that were were shot but um that's not really my thing um i started directing a sketch at the groundlings okay where, yeah a company member for five years back in the 90s and um directing you know a whole sketch show so putting it together deciding where the improvs go who's in what um you know making the act break before intermission you know it was really a lot of assembly and, and a little bit of dramaturgy helping people go like we need to cut this piece down these are the cuts we can make let's focus on that so that kind of uh directing 
um, I learned again at the Groundlings and um, applied it uh, to Puppet Up, which is a current project that I've had going on for mm, 17 years um, with the Jim Henson Company. Um, and I enjoy it. I, I, I enjoy the, the the massive Sudoku, the puzzle of, of putting these kind of shows together. Mm hmm yeah and uh, and on that subject i know i saw you've done some improv comedy work too what, what's that experience like overall for you well that's really where i most of my experience is um when i was at the groundlings you know obviously i did the training then i got into the company and then i did shows there forever and then i taught there um so so improv has been kind of my i guess my leading skill set um it got me on uh two episodes of whose line is it anyway Oh, wow. Um, and also got me on to Curb Your Enthusiasm. All right. Mm. So, you know, which is improv based for the dialogue. Um, and I love it. I love the immediacy of it um, and uh, the the adrenaline rush and the the amount the amount of connection that you have to have with your with your scene partners. You can't phone it in. It, it's, not, it's not like people with a script who can kind of give 30% and if they're really good at it, they can hide that they're giving 30%. Right. You know, you see a, a play that's been running for a year and a half with the same cast. And, you know, sometimes that can happen. You, you can't do that in improv or you'll, you know, you'll, you'll fall off the edge of the improv world. You know, it just won't work. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. So overall, what do you enjoy most about being a part of the acting and directing industry? Um, I'd say right now, um, I'm actually, this is going to sound odd, but I'm actually enjoying auditioning. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which huh. we, I don't hear people say that much. It's, um, <laughs> it's become a real fun little like, oh, here's, you know, I've got 72 hours to pull this together or less. Sometimes you've got like 10 hours um, or, or less than that. I've had ones where it's like, can you get this in like in two hours? Um <laughs> But it's uh it's a it's a lot of uh, uh it's a lot of fun it, you know uh, to to get a new, a new script look at the thing, uh figure out the character get it set up learn the lines. You know, do all the camera setup get a friend do you know read with you via Zoom. So the great thing about COVID, if there's a great thing about COVID, is that the self tape audition is made for people like myself who don't live really close, to. Um, you know, where everything's happening in, in the Valley of LA and, and, and Hollywood and the West side um, to self tape these auditions. Um, so I'm really enjoying them. They're like, you know, they're like a little project, you know? Yeah. An audition or two weeks or three. Yeah. And aud auditioning is a different process now than it was before too. Much so. Yes. Yeah. A lot, a lot's changed. A lot's changed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, big time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, just the, uh, you know, before internet. Okay. Okay. Youngins, I'm going to take you back. <laughs> you know, I'd get a phone call from an agent saying, Hey, we have an audition for you for this show. The audition is next week at this time. We're going to messenger you the script, or maybe they'd fax it. But a lot of times they messengered it. So mm -hmm. be on the lookout for that. So later that day, somebody comes up on your porch, plops a manila envelope down on your welcome mat, walks away. You get it out. It's got your appointment sheet in there, giving you where you're going, the time, who you're meeting with. It's got the the sides for the audition uh, the, that you're going to be reading from. And it has the full script if available. And everything was done you know, like 19th century almost, you know, um, it, it, it was yeah. snake mail, it was Pony Express. Uh, then faxes, people got very excited about faxes for a while. Um, and so you didn't get a lot of last minute auditions. It was rare that it was like, hey, can you get there by two o'clock today? It happened, mm -hmm. but it was rare. Mm. Um, and you'd often have to do several auditions for the same part. You know, you do like a pre-read if you weren't known, then you would do a casting director read. Then you would do a read for the casting director with the producers watching. Mm -hmm. And you would do one of them maybe with um, the studio or the network or both involved. You know, maybe they would send the tape of you doing that to them. It, it, it was a much more involved process. I think for um, 
that movie, The Frighteners, that Michael J. Fox was in, Peter Jackson mm-hmm. directed years ago. Um, I auditioned for that. I think I had eight auditions. I didn't get it. Wow. Uh, but I think I had eight auditions. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That was a lot of driving. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I that, that's yeah, a lot I of bet. putting the same exact you know shirt and sweater on and hoping it still remotely smells fresh. You didn't have time to look at it, but you have to look like you did at the last audition. Too, yeah. too, too much information there. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so I know because uh, we kind of just talked about it a moment ago, but I know uh, Matt had a question about uh, Pup It Up. Yeah. I did. <laughs> All right, you. Hey, what are you doing tonight? I'm supposed to be in this episode. What are you doing? Hey, you know why. You know why you're coming out here. Let's hope <laughs> our camera works. Uh oh. Let's let's hope our camera works. I think I know it's coming. Is it turning on? Oh, there we go. Hey. Turn on. This is ridiculous. Oh, there Hi. we go. Hey. Hi. Hey. Hi. The... I'm not even supposed to. I'm not even supposed to be here. No. <laughs> the only reason he's out here is because. Um, we're we're getting into the puppet up side of things and uh we actually know somebody who you work with uh for puppet up Mm -hmm. all right and Uh, uh, in case you're wondering that oh yeah who would that be that is uh that is grant pachoco yes grant Grant pachoco is who we know yeah that's a that's a great oh yeah yeah where who who makes those puppets i've seen one like that thank you uh it's a company called Silly Puppets that makes these types. Uh huh. We have another one who's built by a guy named Avery Jones. Okay. Uh, inside, inside. I think it, what's his Instagram? Inside my brain comedy. Yes, that's it. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh. Silly Puppets is who designs these monsters. Yeah, I yeah. have a monster of mine. Of who's a little green monster. His name is Speen, which is also from Silly Puppets too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have a I have a yeah. puppet as well. It was made from like a Muppet whatnot uh, that they used to sell at FEO Schwartz. I remember the yeah the the uh, the whatnot workshop at yeah. FEO Schwartz. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How does its mouth move though? Is it it's hard? Yeah. Yeah. It's not like the best thing to work with, but. Yeah, yeah, but but I mean yeah. they look beautiful and they're oh yeah they're, they're great souvenir and, and an art piece, yeah. but yeah yeah. The, oh, yeah. Um, the, the the mouth movement. I'm not a puppeteer. Oh, yeah. but I've been around them for so long that I figured some things out, you know, just by yeah. asking. Yeah, right. I know what they complain about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Puppets with tiny little mouth. <laughs> you can't move. Oh, and we got quite a, There's a puppet. Yep. And we got <laughs> quite a bit to complain about. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Sure. They, well, yeah, you know what? Puppeteers are not re- as respected as they should be. In, in the business, they uh-uh. people see the puppet and forget about the puppeteer constantly. And that's yeah. part of the magic of what what they do. But the exactly. downside of it is that they can be stuck in a box and nobody even cares. They're like, maybe they need some water. Maybe they need to get out of the box for a while. Yeah. You know? it, yeah. yeah. And if you, if you look at characters like Kermit or Fozzie or Miss Piggy, you know, yeah. They wouldn't be who they are now without their original performers like Jim Henson and Frank Oz. They wouldn't. They wouldn't yeah. exist. Period. Yeah. They would, they would exactly. Just be, they'd just be a hollow doll, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're yeah. Because yeah. they're all Jim Henson's characters. He created all of them. And mm-hmm. and Frank created mm-hmm. his and everything. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, they uh, it, and it's their voice, their comic voice coming through all of the characters. Um, and the characters' movement. And the way mm-hmm. the characters speak and how ultimately they're written for when scripts were written. Um, the heart of the character. You know, um, in, in finding a new Kermit, um, they had a workshop with about five or six really top-notch virtuoso puppeteers. All of whom did the Kermit voice really credibly. Some, you know, according to, you know, Brian Henson were, you know, uh, like vocal doppelgangers for his dad, but they were all really good. Any one of them could have done it. And um, it ended up being uh, Matt Bogle, who yes. was wonderful. And, you know, and, and he's yeah. um, kind of like a, I don't know, we, we, savant is the wrong word, but like, my God, he can he can do such a wide variety 
of voices and characters and really act them and um and 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 nail it you know Definitely. i mean yeah um but there were a bunch of really great guys there and and finding the the the, the heart of of the character the one that kind of just mm, just kind of matched that was that was the fine tuning that was really hard for the people that made the decision i was not a decider yeah yeah because i know they wanted yeah. someone whose voice was closer to jim henson's rather than you know steve's right for so many years yeah oh, yeah yeah Definitely. yeah they were trying to recapture that 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 certain gooiness or whatever it was that you know mm -hmm. that was a word that they were using gooey yeah 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 so i guess in terms of uh puppet up how did that idea kind of come about well, um, originally I was approached um, to go interview with um, Brian's wife, Mia Sarah, um, about possibly teaching improv to puppeteers. Mm -hmm. So I went and had a meeting with her and we talked about improv and talked about how it can benefit all performers. Um, I was told a little bit about how the Henson puppeteers work, which is that they have mm -hmm. the puppet above, above, above their head, whether they're standing or sitting or whatever, it's up here. And they're looking at a camera or monitor rather to see the what the camera sees of the puppet. So the, the puppeteers are not looking at each other like improvisers do, like improvisers must do, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So many subtle communications happen in eye contact. A, a little squint, um, a little bit, you know, um, a widening of the eyes, the, the pupils dilating or pinpointing or whatever, um, you know, tell us what another person's feeling, what their motivation mm -hmm. is, what they're about to do, you know, are they hiding something? There's so much that we as actors get from eye contact. And these puppeteers don't get to have that because they have to be looking at the monitor to see how the puppet looks and how it's moving on screen. That's the that's the brilliant Jim Henson technique, and it is brilliant. So um, I had to alter that, you know, to a degree. I had to like take certain exercises that depended much on eye contact and adjust them to be purely oral listening and listening for intent and listening for intonation and also making sure that they conveyed with the voice and the body movement of the puppet. Definitely. Mm -hmm. For you know that they were communicating that for the audience and the other puppeteer because if this is improv with puppeteers and they're not scripted, they have to build off of what they just saw. Right. And yes. if what they just saw didn't communicate any oomph, had have any voltage to it, then the response will likely also be a little bit energyless. Yeah. So uh, talked to Brian about that. We had a great meeting. I started teaching some classes there. It was supposed to be a six-week program. Um, at, toward the end of the six weeks, he said, hey, um, everyone's loving it. Do you want to keep doing it? And I said, yeah, I do. Because it was such a fun way after doing improv for so long to do it differently. To have these new restrictions and these new gifts and to... Um, and, and just to see improv in a different light with those restrictions and gifts. Um, so as I was exploring it and the cast were exploring it, we were all kind of learning together. Um, I think we were probably in like around that six week point when I said to Brian, I go, I think they should do like a little, a little show, you know, here on the lot, maybe at lunchtime, the employees can bring, you know, their lunch over and, you know, we can set up a, a thing for them to watch some of the, puppet improv so that the puppeteers would get the experience of getting a suggestion from somebody that isn't me um having walls of laughter come at them that they have to hold for you know just everything that an audience brings that class doesn't and um brian said yeah let's think about that and then the next thing i knew he had set dates aside we were doing it on the sound stage, which is the historic Chaplin sound stage at the jim henson lot it was charlie Chaplin's studio originally and they rented bleachers. So we had an audience of 200, like an invitational from the industry. We were doing a show, you know, we had sound, we had lights, we had cameras, we had action. And we did, we did an evening and got a standing ovation. People were so excited about the combination of puppets and improv. 
at this um at this level henson wow. puppeteering <laughs> and improv yeah. um that we did another one and we got asked to go do a festival uh the aspen comedy festival from there we got asked to do the edinburgh festival from there we got asked to do the um uh, comedy festival in australia melbourne oh wow and it, it just took off from there and then we started doing monthly shows in la and kept the classes going and it, it just it just arose organically it just happened it was not the intention at the first meeting to like hey let's create a show that's going to last 17 years <laughs> Wow. That was awesome, though. Now, I know you kind of touched up on this already, but, you know, getting to work, getting to meet and, you know, work with some of the, uh, you know, puppeteers that would come in. What is that like? Uh, great. Great. Um, there are such a wide variety of personalities and like improvisers, you know, they have their own kind of their own brand of nerddom, you know, which uh, improvisers do. Um, and it was you know just really fun um meeting them getting to know them and then finding out oh my god you're you're the chicken on the foster farms commercials yeah. oh my god you were the goose in babe and like i'd known the person for like a year but i hadn't like gone and checked their credits or anything and mm -hmm. then to you know or be watching something like uh, that has a puppet and going like i think i recognize that puppetry and i think i recognize that voice and then it turns out to be somebody that's in the classes or one of our cast members. Um, so that's always fun because, you know, obviously when you work with, you know, regular fleshy actors, you, you recognize them instantly or you see them on something, you recognize them. But with the puppet thing, there's this moment of like, the way that puppet's running sure reminds me of this person. And then it's really fun when you're right. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> So makes it a little bit like a, where's Waldo. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you also teach improv classes and team building through improv. Can you talk a bit about those? <laughs> yeah, after I'm done coughing. Hold on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Okay. Yeah, teaching is actually my favorite thing to do. More than more than acting, more than directing, more than anything. Um. Of course the acting on union jobs on in tv and film is what you know i make more money at and get my medical insurance through and everything <laughs> but teaching is um is so gratifying and so fun and and it's it's like improv it's here and now it's the moment it's communication um and i don't think i ever really thought of it that way until just this moment so thank you for asking that question yeah of course definitely that is that is what it is it's it's the most immediate real here and now experience to be presenting a concept to someone having them try to digest it and then them trying to execute it and then giving them a little finesse like oh great 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 um try it this time you know slower faster try it this time as if there's resistance. Try it this time as if it's the easiest thing. You do it all the time. And and that gets me to be able to play in terms of finding the way to get that person from A to B. And every student is like a Rubik's Cube, like with different stickers on it and a totally different setup. And so it's fun figuring out how people learn, um, seeing what they already know intuitively and instinctively and building on that and also shining a light to that going, look, you already know this that really empowers people, you know, when they mm -hmm. realize like improv, when people come to me and say, I, oh, I'm scared to do improv. I don't know what I'd say. That's very common, especially with really trained actors who didn't do improv because they're dependent oh. on the script. And we talk a little bit and I go, look, there's a dirty little secret here, which is that you've been improvising your entire life. Every conversation, mm -hmm. every interaction, every time you cross the street, you know exactly yeah every yeah. time you have you um the, the cashier tells you how much something is you know put your card in or you know swipe or you know whatever um <laughs> everything is you responding to external stimulus and we just take it for granted that we know how to do that we can kind of sleepwalk through life but the fact of the matter is we are improvising we better yes and that bus coming at us and get back up on the curb so we don't get hit by it Exactly. 
We yeah. have to accept that it's there. We have to notice that it's there. And we have to take an action in light of the fact that it's there and it's coming toward us. So when people start realizing that you, they already know how to improvise, um, it's very empowering for them. And then it's just like, well, how, now how do we improvise for an audience? How do we improvise if we're trying to tell a story? How do we improvise if we're um, trying to serve another character? Like the other character is the one we're really interested in. And how do we improvise in a supportive manner to get that character where they want to go, where they need to go, to challenge them, to support them? Um, one thing I'll do often, especially with the team building kind of workshops, that, which you mentioned, is first thing as I do is I pair people off, um, preferably with someone they don't know. And if they all know each other, I have a, a plan B. But I say, all right, um, I want you to uh, just talk. For the next two minutes, just talk. If you're stymied, I'll give you a topic, but otherwise just talk. Yeah. And then yeah. I'm walking around and watching how it's going. Is one person talking at length and the other person is just nodding? Um, is, is it a very even exchange? Are they grooving on each other and getting kind of excited about like, yes, I did the same thing. I went to that school, whatever. Afterwards, we talk about those conversations. You know, how were they? Did you feel heard? Were you distracted when you were listening? When the other person was talking, were you thinking about what you were going to say next? You know? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and what they find is that, one, it was effortless and easy. And yes, they did zone out maybe once or twice, and that happens. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just like, that's, that's improv. And it's not all about what you say. It's also about how you feel, how you make the other one feel, um, what you do in the silences, mm -hmm. if anything. Yeah. Yeah. So getting people off of the, I've got to be fast, I've got to be verbal, and I've got to be funny. Getting them out of that place instantly empowers them and takes away a lot of the panic. But the people who want to be the fast talking improv, like, Look at me, I'm Jim Carrey too, you know, and take over the scene and not let anyone get a word in edgewise and, and have everyone afterwards go, you were the funniest one. Those people, it's really hard for them to, to, to shift gears into this more collaborative, more ensemble approach because they're rewarded for being such a showboat. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that does not get the job done, unfortunately. So you know, um, building people's confidence and then also trying to like redirect them without breaking their confidence is is part of the challenge. But yes, I love teaching. Sorry, that was like a big sermon I just did. That was no, big... that's absolutely <laughs> no, fine. That's no, fine. It's... It'll all be no, on the it's... test, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what I said at this point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no worries. Now you got me on a tear. <laughs> I love that dog. The dog has like one spot. He's like, you're part cow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, part, just... just a little bit cow. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> yeah, 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 her, yeah, her name is Betty. So. Betty? Yeah. 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 She's. Hello, Betty, yeah. part cow. <laughs> 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 Yes. Yeah. Now, let me ask you guys, are, are you guys performers? Um, not, well, I mean. Well, I am, technically. technically. What do you mean technically? What's that supposed to mean? Yeah, no, like, like. I I mean, you're you're, you're um, hosting a podcast, so I guess you are podcast performers in, in, in that area, but have, have yeah. any of you done improv? Or done puppetry other than what we saw <laughs> earlier with, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've done puppetry. I even have like a YouTube channel of my of my uh, monster who does you know sort of video. So, so yeah, I'm oh, I'm sorry. Cool. I'm, yeah, email me the link. Yeah. yeah, and Matt does yeah, as, Matt does as well. What he does mo what he does mostly is um he has like Instagram live streams. Yeah, where he, where, we, where him been... and some yeah where him and some of his other puppetry friends have we've their been, puppets we've on. We've been doing that. We've been doing that what almost three years? Yeah, it'll be three years in May. Oh, fun! Yeah, yeah, very. And fun. I kind of and I do it occasionally as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And yeah, have we, you guys? We, 
Have you taken any puppeteer training or are you self-taught? I am self-taught. Self-taught, self-taught. So yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty self-taught, yeah. Self -taught. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so, so certain people, uh, you know, some 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 things you don't need, you know, too much help for some, you know, some people work differently and sometimes things people can learn on yeah. their own. Yeah, absolutely. Develop on their own, yeah. That's mm -hmm. another huge change just generationally between like my generation and yours is the all the YouTube tutorials and the exposure to good yeah. and not good work yeah. gives you you can be at home and develop your eye and go, that's good, that's weak. I don't want to do that. I want to do this. How are they doing that? Analyze it. You know, maybe take a, an mm. online lesson if you have to, if you're not an autodidact, if you don't kind of teach yourself. Um, and it's amazing. Um, and I I think it's fantastic. I mean, I, I learned how to put the, the new bumper on my Prius that way, um, <laughs> which, you know, 30, 40 years ago would not have happened. I mean, maybe, but yeah. I would, it would have been much harder. I would have had to go buy this manual if I could find the manual of, I would have had to go to <clears throat> one of those junkyards where, you know, find a car that matched um, and it wasn't jacked up. Um, and here it was, everything was online, the parts, the, the, how to, you know, how to uh, put it on, um, you know, uh, tutorial, it still wasn't easy, mind you, mm -hmm. but the fact that I, that I could learn that, or you can learn some basics of puppetry or learn improv or, so many things um online is fantastic it, it, it's like magic to me definitely yeah yeah for sure the puppet agrees yeah yeah i agree <laughs> yeah i do i agree so you want to ask this one yeah so besides puppet up and teaching improv can you share any projects that you're currently working on well i have one that i've had in the works for years okay I'm beginning to think I'm never going to do it because like, I just like preparing for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of my uh, hobbies is, uh, is, is play the harp and I, I'm not good. Um, but I play with the harp. Let's put it that way. And I've done a lot yeah. of, you know, a lot of self-teaching. I've taken some lessons over the years. I've also gone like a decade without even owning a harp, you know? So it really has been that, the equivalent of like that friend of yours who's got a guitar in the closet that's dusty or in the corner of the living room and they never pick it up. And then they go and they're like, oh, you if you practiced, you could do something with that. That's me. Just that I'm a permanent beginner. But I wanted to do a character that used the harp. And so I started writing some stuff up and one of the characters was female. And so I was going to, you know, obviously I was going to shave and, um, and <laughs> do this kind of like fun drag um ish um kind of character um i played around with that a little bit toothpick wasn't coming out clean i was like i'm not sure what i'm doing here what am i trying to say so uh lately i've been recording a piece of music with uh again self-teaching ukulele i play the clarinet still a little bit using the harp using garage band figuring out which mic sounds good on which instrument so that's my project right now is i'm trying to like home record and 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 put these multi tracks together and then do the vocals and if i can get that soup to nuts done then i may shoot video to go with nice really nice we'll see <laughs> if i do that we'll see <laughs> well i'll definitely we'll definitely be looking forward to it if it you know it's out there yeah yeah, yeah don't hold your oh, yeah we will <laughs> so as an actor and director what challenges would you say you faced during your career um well you know the the, the director thing isn't really like you know a uh, part of my wheelhouse that much i mean like, i like again i've done it in such a specific niche improv and sketch yeah. that mm -hmm. i don't know that i've faced any challenges with that um except the ones you all face you know um you're taking a show to, to other countries and you meet the crew and they have a different um, language and a different way of doing things and you're having to build a show and you know they're talking about like which side of the stage I say stage left they go what I go <laughs> they go you mean prompt and I'm like yeah oh you call that prompt okay great um <laughs> you know <laughs> all this crazy uh those challenges right um managing uh the um the uh morale 
of a cast because an improv cast has to basically fall in love with each other every time they go out on stage. And that's a taller. Uh -huh. So the chemistry is really important. Um, and um, in terms of an actor, I'd say the challenges have been to learn myself, to learn how I react. How have I programmed myself? What's my software? When yeah. I'm afraid of a certain audition, am I right to be, or am I setting myself up? Do I need to knuckle down and face it? Or is it like, no, this is too much. This is 12 pages of a high-end, posh British accent. It's not a comedy. I cannot deliver this in three days to you. I'm backing off. I'm going to pass on this audition. So that kind of thing, learning what you can and what you can't do, what yeah. you should what you shouldn't do, and not taking mm -hmm. things personally. You know, that's been probably the... Um, my, if I have a superpower, it's that in the business. I've never felt like, oh, I'm owed this. Or why did they go with that guy? It's it's all fair. In its unfairness, yeah. it's all completely fair. And um, so my opportunities will come to me as they do, as they will, and as they won't. Um, and that's given me a certain, I think, ability to survive the ups and downs and the dry periods and the occasional things that could be considered humiliations <laughs> um, with a sense of humor and knowing that that has nothing to do with really with me or the universe in all of its, you know, gazillions of years of, of history and future, hopefully um, it really doesn't matter. So I think having that not taking it personally um, kind of approach to myself yeah. in this crazy business um, has just allowed me to go with the flow. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I've, I've been fired from a couple jobs where I wasn't good enough. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Or I wasn't right, you know, whatever. But like, you know, I auditioned, I got the part, I went through about a day of rehearsal and they, they just kind of were like, yeah, this is not the way it's going. And uh, I got fired. <laughs> and then they hired like some really good looking guy. <laughs> and one of them i called the writer's room afterwards i said okay i get it i get why because i knew i knew the showrunner i said i get it i understand why you know it didn't work out no hard feelings what i am confused about is why did you go for another male model <laughs> <laughs> and he was quiet for a second just like you guys and, and then i guess i was on speakerphone the entire room erupted um i go Cause that just doesn't make sense you just got another guy with abs you know and chiseled. <laughs> you had that. So I, I think without that kind of sense of humor, this can be a really harsh business. It can be really hard yeah. on people. And you don't want to get rid of your sensitivity, but you do want to manage it. Mm -hmm. Worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you wanna you wanna learn a healthy way of of dealing with what the inevitable challenges are gonna be. And some of them are gonna be hard and heartbreaking. Yeah. If you let them. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what piece would you give to anyone who wants to get into the field of acting and directing? Like what, like what piece of advice? Oh, yeah, yeah. I gotcha. Um, you know, I, assuming that this person would be young, late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, or whatever, even 30s. Take your time and train. Definitely, yeah. Time and train and learn to love the training. Don't think of it as a, a hurdle you need to get beyond. Because I've had those students in the past who just were like, if I just get beyond this class, I'm going to get beyond the next class, and then I'm going to get on Saturday Night Live, and my life is going to start. And they're not taking in the process. They're not learning. Learn to love rehearsals. Learn to love those auditions. Love it all. But take the time and train. I don't have any regrets. My life is taken me interesting places, challenging places, um, some places that were really, really hard. But um, if I was going back, if I was forced to go back and do it again, you know, I had no choice to go, but we're taking you right back to, you're 18, you're just done that musical in high school, you've decided now you're gonna be an actor. I would do some things differently because I have a maturity now, I didn't have that. But if I had that maturity back then, I'd go, all right, I'm gonna train 
seriously. I'm not going to worry about when I'm going to start working professionally. I'm not going to feel like I need to get cast in something now. I'm going to be satisfied mm -hmm. to do shows in my college and, you know, amateur productions and stuff like that. As I'm training, I'm going to get the best training I can afford in my area. If I need to move, I'm going to take a year, work my job, save money so that I can make that move. And, you know, make sure that I really am training myself. Cause I'll tell you, um, a lot of actors that you see out there in even just the silliest, silliest comedies, a lot of them have really great training and background. Um, the mother on Malcolm in the Middle. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yale School of Drama. Wow. All right. Um, lots of, uh, you know, actors that went to Juilliard, Northwestern, um, you know, studied for years, maybe in a Meisner program where, you know, you're not supposed to be working while you're training. You're supposed to devote, you know, two years to that training. Yeah. Um, I would say it's good to have ambition. It's good to have goals. But if it really is just to want to be a star, just to want to be out there, I don't know, maybe rethink it because it's it's going to be really challenging. And if you don't love it, to, it, it comprehensively, holistically. Right. Mm -hmm. Good stuff and the bullshit. And you yeah, know, exactly. <laughs> yes. And do, yeah. it, do it if it's something you legitimately want to do. Have to do. Yeah. If you have to do it. You know, and if you're somebody who you think like, you know, what, I just like to be in front of people and on camera, then, you know, get a degree in meteorology, yeah. develop your personality on camera and become the weather guy. And, you know, you'll have it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you'll have a more steady career. You'll, um, <laughs> you'll be on camera. You'll be on TV. People will recognize you. Maybe you'll be funny when you do the weather. Um, maybe you'll even get to like occasionally Go be the, the guest star and do a play, even though you're not necessarily qualified for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but if you put yourself into the competition with the people that are, you know, heavily, heavily trained, you better be heavily trained as well or, or be that rare natural that just has it. And I've just never really seen that. I mean, I've seen people who are naturals and they've got something, but nothing replaces experience and training. Right, definitely. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah. Are there any words you'd like to say to those watching or listening who have supported your work over the years? Um, thank you. A massive thank you. Because, you know, um, I have been this little character actor who does supporting roles, and I've been really fortunate enough to do them on many things that got seen a lot, high profile. Um, including mm -hmm. stupid stuff like showgirls, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and the fact that anybody connected with my characters, I'm like, you know what? I like that character, or I think that guy is funny, or I like him, or whatever. That's 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 not necessary, and and how how lovely that it happened at all. And that I continue to have, you know, anyone even remotely interested in my take on things or what I've done. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. I, so thank you. It's yeah. a massive, massive thank you. It, it's, um, it's been very fulfilling. Yeah. So awesome. here's, a, here's an interesting question. Do you ever get, do you ever get like recognized at all for like, you know, from, well, for say like Sweet Life fans, like if you're out on the street or whatever? Yeah, you know, which amazes me because I don't really look like that anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, my hair color's changed. It's been many years. I'm older. I look like that guy's dad, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but occasionally somebody recognizes it's often after I speak. So I guess my voice... Oh, okay, yeah. Um, okay. Voice is somewhat recognizable. It, obviously, it doesn't sound like that to me. But... um. <laughs> somebody will be looking at me like like well, where do i know you from and then i speak and they go oh you know zach and cody yeah. or oh you're the wig master from seinfeld or whatever um people will say hey where do i know you from <laughs> yeah. 
And I'll look at them and I kind of like look at their age and everything like that. And I go, probably Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. And they go, yes, because I, I clock the age, the generation. I go, that's not somebody who watched Seinfeld probably as much or certainly wasn't an Ellen fan, you know, well, yeah. when they were two. So, uh, so you know, it, it's generally nice when yeah. people do that. I had one that was very funny. I was working on a show, say what, just one what is or anything like that. But um, we, at rehearsal, we had our masks on. So I had my masks on and I don't have my hat here, but I had my, my baseball hat and my mask, right? <laughs> and the rehearsal's going on and an actress who was on the show was about 20 feet away and looking at me. And I didn't act with her, so I never in, in dealt with her. The next day we were there and we're doing camera stuff. So we took our masks off for the camera. And she looks at me and she goes, oh my God, it's you. We did this together. She goes, I was looking at, I was looking at you yesterday. And I couldn't figure out who is that. And she, and she went, I just kept thinking those eyeballs, those eyeballs, those eyeballs. I was like, what am I Marty Feldman? Like, are my eyeballs that intense? Um, <laughs> apparently, apparently, my eyeballs are a notable feature. Wow. <laughs> Wow! Oh my gosh! Who would have thought? Yeah. It was hilarious, actually. Yeah. yeah. Those eyeballs. Those. <laughs> those are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so okay. if so so people want to connect with you, where can people find you? Um, no, I do. I don't really do like a lot of social media. I'm not doing Twitter anymore. Um, understandable. Not... Yeah, Twitter is a very dark place. Yeah. Yep, yeah, bye bye now <laughs> to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Instagram, I have, I think I have an account. I don't check it. I think last time I checked it, it was like, you've got 1,050, you know, messages or something, you know, most of which were. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh like when, like, you know, where are you? You too good to come out here and talk to us? It's like, now I'm just an idiot. <laughs> um, hey, hey. So hey. to connect with me, you know, I don't know. Um, but uh, I guess. Facebook, I, you can get messages if you're, I, I don't think I can add friends on Facebook right now, but, um, or can I, I don't know. So to ask your, answer your question, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not trying to be, yeah, I, don't I really don't know. No, 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 no it's no, fine, that's fine. It's fine. No, no it's just in case if you have, you know, social media is still there, you know. Yeah, so I mean, we, we can't, we can't like some scrimshire. Yeah, a lot of yeah, people hello. do, they, they want to plug that and they have all their logos. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> yes. Like this one we're about to put up for this last question. Oh, hey, nice. Hey, yes. See that? See there you go. There you go. Look, look at that. Look at that post production. Look at that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Now, of course, I'm not seeing it right now. That will actually be put in a post. But I'm pretending like yes. that, and I'm clapping. Yeah. Of course. It could be right here. It could be there. Maybe they put it over here over my lights. Maybe it's down here. <laughs> yeah. Have, have, have fun post production. You're gonna have fun with that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> a whole Yay. area. Right Look at all this real estate here. I took a, I took a painting down for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, so this is this last question is the question we ask all of our guests at the end. So, oh boy. Now, this podcast is of course called Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. In your own words, uh, what do you what do you think of when you hear the word nostalgia? Or how would you define the word nostalgia? All right, two ways. One, the common way of just like that memory of something, whether it's visual, other sensory, smell, you know, whatever, that brings back and re re uh invigorates and recreates a wonderful feeling almost like a recording of that feeling that i had before back in the 70s let's say and by seeing something hearing something watching something smelling something tasting something having the entire body act as if it's having that experience for the same time it's chemical it's something changes Maybe it's in the brain, maybe it's in the bloodstream. I don't know, but it's like something changes and you experience that again. Um, so that would be my my first thing. I, I, I should have been a scientist. Um, my <laughs> second thing is just the fact that nostalgia literally means knowledge, I think, of pain. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> especially especially the, um, the <laughs> when you go down the knee one time. And, uh, yeah. Ah. Oh, genuflect? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, anyway, example. nostalgia, um, I think it's is like, I, I, I could be wrong here. You, everyone can look it up. This is your homework. But I think <laughs> it means, literally means memory of pain in Greek or something like that. Alja, neuralgia, you know, whatever. Um, so now that I, I've heard that recently, I cannot help but thinking about nostalgia and thinking that wistful nostalgia. Not, I'm not always that positive nostalgia, but that like, oh God, that was so good and it's gone. Yeah. So there's your yeah. bummer. There's your bummer answer to buzz kill everyone at the end of this podcast. <laughs> I think we need. I yeah. think we need the puppet to do something um happy now that I brought the room down. <laughs> there we what go. do you what What do you want me awesome. to do? You just did it. You laughed. You yeah. You, you had your hand up here. Okay, there you go. You threw your head back. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. All that. And That's all it takes. Motion. I feel proud. <laughs> Yeah. Well, a anyway, Patrick, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. This was a blast. Yes, thank My pleasure, you. gentlemen. Thank you guys were awesome. Project. Great thank questions, you. and uh, hope it all comes together for you. you get yes, you uh, yes, and I will uh, email you as soon as this goes up too. Yes, okay. and, and right, thank you, and, and thank you for your work. You know, being part of our charts. You know, keep up the great work and see what's next for you. Especially, you know, you know, where you see what's going to happen in the future, like where you, you know, recording and, and you, all that other stuff. And back yeah. at you guys for all of your pursuits. Good luck. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. And thank keep, you. Thank keep, you in, much. keep in touch. We'll do. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. See you, Patrick. Have a Take great care, rest Patrick. of your day. Have a great rest of your day. See you. Bye. 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 And, and it's goodbye from us. Yep. Yes. yes, that is right. Absolutely enjoyed our time with Patrick Bristow. And as always, yes. you know, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Keep and nostalgia we'll see alive. you with more fun interviews. Yes. See you next time. Bye-bye. Coming bye, up on our Take care. Yes. Bye-bye, everybody. Yes, we're very – yes, we're very – we're planning to do something big for Big 100, so keep your eye out for that. So, stay tuned anyway. the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Anyway, bye. <laughs> bye, everyone. Take care. Bro. Farewell. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye bye. <laughs>